Hey, wait a minute. I have a story to tell. I hate Christmas carolers. Blue snippers. Watch it, watch it, watch it! So this guy, Rand Peltzer, is in Chinatown trying to sell some of his crappy inventions to shops that nobody goes to. Nobody. Some kid lures him into a basement where his grandfather's shop apparently doesn't have working electricity. And after seeing all of the authentic Chinese items for sale, Rand tries to convince the owner to sell his cheap plastic Wish.com reject of a travel kit. But then he hears some noise from across the room and goes to investigate. He comes across this animal called a mogwai and wants to get it for his son for Christmas, but it's not for sale. So after Rand's desperate attempt to buy the mogwai, that's $200. The grandfather goes to take a shit or something, leaving the mogwai unattended for the grandson to sell. But there are rules to follow when you own a mogwai. One, you have to keep them away from bright light. Two, you can't get them wet. And three, don't feed them after midnight. It's important, trust me. Anyway, it's the next day, and Rand's son Billy is running late to work at the bank. And he's one of those weird people who have to bring their dogs with them everywhere. The loser. And ties Barney up under a station. His crush, Kate, wants him to sign a petition so the town Karen, Mrs. Deagle, can't shut down the local dive bar. This woman has everyone afraid of her because she has money, but also because she hates everything. Oh. She's kind of like the town's homeowners association. Apparently, Barney broke her snowman this morning, and now she wants to kill the dog. Yeah, butthole. So after Barney hears how she wants to do it, Maybe I'll put him in my spin dryer on high heat. He defends himself. And then Mrs. Deagle can't decide whether to be aggressive or be the victim. So she does both. You mangy cur. Oh, my heart! After work, Billy goes to the dive bar to get a beer. Hello, Gerald. He gets harassed by his boss, Gerald, who tells him he's a piece of crap. I would have fired you in a second. And then he tries to hang out with him. And somehow after being at the bar long enough to make a detailed sketch of Mrs. Deagle, Billy finally notices that Kate's working there, even though the bar is about the size of a living room. You're working here? He then goes home, where nothing works right, because his dad sucks at his job. And because they don't have any money, apparently his mom's making diced onions for dinner. Well, what's not to like? Well, Rand comes home from his business trip and has a present for Billy. They dim the lights, and Billy opens the box, and the mogwai pops out. <laughs> And he kind of looks like a brown baby Yoda, but furry. So Billy's mom goes to take a picture of her son and his new pet, but when the flash goes off, the mogwai flips the fuck out. And that's when Rand is like, oh, that's right, let me tell you about the rules for this thing. So after the inventor tells them that what he named Gizmo is basically the most pain in the ass thing he could have gotten his son, Billy takes him upstairs to find out that a rodent is better at playing piano than he is. So he blinds the shit out of him. <laughs> The next morning, Billy goes to make some fresh orange juice and is using one of his dad's inventions. And it also seems that he might be the one who invented Glenn's waterbed. Fantastic ideas for a fantastic world. I make the illogical logical. So a Christmas tree barges into the Peltzer home, dragging a dead friend for them to decorate for the holiday. So Billy has this child take off his costume and then he takes him up to his bedroom. And apparently this kid comes over a lot because he just has a seat on the bed while Billy takes his shirt off. See if there's something you like. He discovers Gizmo, and Billy takes him away from the child holding milk and puts him on a table next to a water-filled mason jar. And of course, when Pete tries to pick him up, the water spills on him. And he dies? No, he gets pregnant, and the babies pop out of him like ping pong balls I saw on the show in Tijuana. I don't wanna see this, Jonesy. Man, I can't see this. Shut up a minute. But Pete doesn't give a shit and lays back on the bed to read comics. Look at what he said, he's crazy. Billy goes to tell his dad about what happened, but it seems five new mogwais aren't important enough for Billy to interrupt his dad from telling him about one of his crappy inventions. And after seeing the new ones being a dick to Gizmo, Rand's like, we could sell these, and people would finally respect the name Peltzer. But that night, the new ones tie Barney up with Christmas lights and hang him from the porch. Those buttholes. Well, they also haven't been trained like Gizmo has. Well, I was born yesterday. But the family doesn't even suspect the mogwais. In fact, Billy thinks that old Mrs. Deagle broke in, walked all the way up to the third floor, and risked taking a dog that previously attacked her from his home while he's laying next to his owner. I'll get you when you least expect it. And Barney must be a nightmare to dry, because it's daylight when he finally finishes toweling him off. But his dad is going to leave again for another convention, and he's going to take Barney to his grandma's to be safe. So Billy thinks that it would be a good idea to learn more about the Mogwais, so he takes one to his middle school biology teacher and immediately gets it pregnant and leaves the newborn with this dude to run tests on it. So on his way home, he sees Kate locking up the bar, meaning that either Dory's Tavern closes super early on the weekdays or he was at that school for a really long time. 
She's also kicking out Billy's neighbor, Mr. Futterman, who they're about to let drive home when he's drunk off his ass, until he starts rattling off about gremlins being shipped from Europe. They put him in the cars, they put him in the TV, they put him in the stereos. Billy walks Kate home, hoping to get some one-on-one -on -one time with her, but she wants to talk about seasonal depression, and then she snaps on him for asking why she doesn't like Christmas, and he's like, shit, I should have walked the drunk guy home. But the power of boners is strong, and he asks her out on a date, despite her sucking the joy out of the entire month of December. Now I'm depressed. So once he gets home, he eats in front of the creatures that aren't supposed to eat after midnight. And of course, they get hungry because of this and beg to be fed. He notices that he's still got a few minutes left, so he goes to get them some food. He gets what's entirely way too much chicken, but we've seen how many onions his mom cuts up, so I would hate to pay the grocery bill in this house. It's high. It's very high. So all but Gizmo devour the chicken, and then one at the middle school gets a sandwich too. And a closer look reveals that it's after 2 a.m. So Billy falls asleep and wakes up to his room covered in giant boogers. It seems that the Mogwai broke his clock and tricked him into feeding him so they could transform. Into boogers? No, not into boogers. They're in cocoons and they're changing into something else. Into what? Lori, what's the name of the story? Oh yeah. Idiot. So Billy goes back to the school to find the teacher has the same problem and they open the cage to get samples. Rand calls from the road and we see that he's entirely out of his depth. He can't even get one of his inventions to work but someone at the convention has invented a time machine. I'm just a little more advanced than I expected. And Rand tells his wife that he should be home in time tomorrow to open presents. And we also find out that the cocoons are starting to hatch. Well, the students are saved by the bell, and the teacher calls Billy at work to let him know that they hatched. Now, I can understand the bank closing early, but why the hell is there school on Christmas Eve? It is a prison for children. Anyway, the teacher goes back to the classroom to lure the thing out, but when he tries to feed it, he stupidly doesn't pull his hand back from under the desk, and it bites him. Billy shows up looking for him, but finds him dead with a needle in his butt. Oh, my butt! Not sure how he got under the desk, though. Billy goes for the phone, but gets scratched. And after it retreats through an air vent, Billy, being very first aid savvy, goes to the nurse's office to clean his wound. You know, instead of getting the fuck out of there. What's he doing? But the gremlin's already in there, and attacks him by throwing gauze at him. After it runs away, he realizes that his mom might be in trouble too. Oh, great. Well, Lynn hears a ruckus upstairs and grabs the large knife that she apparently was using to make gingerbread cookies. She goes upstairs to find the room empty, but then she hears some music playing downstairs and goes to investigate. She finds one eating her cookies, and when it goes to eat some dough, she turns the mixer on and blends the little shit. That'd do it all right. Then another one starts throwing plates at her, and she stabs that one to death. And then another one throws a cookie tray at her, and she puts him in the microwave and turns it on. But she hears another one in the other room, and grabs two more knives, and then double checks that the one that just blew up in the microwave was dead. She's kind of a badass, but she may not be that bright. Sure, kid, whatever you say. Well, there's one in the Christmas tree that surprises her, but Billy comes in and uses one of the swords on their wall to decapitate it, and send its head into the fireplace. But there's still one left the one with the mohawk, Stripe, and he jumps out of the window into the snow. So there's gonna be more of them now? No. Why would you say that? Cause snow is water? Shut up. They have to get wet, and now that they're scaly, you have to assume that they're cold-blooded, and maybe snow wouldn't melt on their skin. I find that answer vague and unconvincing. So Billy takes his mom to the neighbor's house because she cut her cheek, and then he goes back to the house to see all the gremlins that his mom massacred. What the hell is this? He hears Gizmo in the laundry chute and goes to rescue him. He puts him in a backpack and then follows Stripe's footprints. They lead to the local YMCA where they happen to have a pool that Stripe jumps into. Now him getting wet is one thing, but the babies getting wet too is something entirely different. But wait, they're in a lot of pain when they give birth, so I really doubt that most of them could get out of the water before they drowned. So I guess all the ones that do make it out of here are just born on a pile of gremlin corpses after the pool filled up. <laughs> So Billy realizes that he's outmatched and goes to the cops who are drinking on the job. And of course, they don't believe him. Go on home, sit by the fireplace, and open your Christmas presents, okay? So he gives him a biology lesson and shows him Gizmo. But now the new gremlins are out running around and they're doing all sorts of diabolical shit, like messing with people's TV reception and Christmas caroling. That's not so bad. Come on, we're talking cable. But they also bulldoze Mr. Futterman's house, proving him right about the existence of gremlins. That's the same gremlins brought down our planes in the big one. 
Stripe, who's somehow still alive, is at Mrs. Deagle's place, where we see that her business is only open for 45 minutes a day. And given that she has to use a chairlift to get her up and downstairs, there's no way that she's the one who hung Barney from the porch. But we see that even her cats hate her. <laughs> so when they rewire her chairlift and launch her out the window, nobody gives a shit. The old bat never looked better. The cops see this, and Santa being attacked, and they just decide to take off. But their brakes have been cut, and they crash. You always get to drive, because I'm the sheriff, asshole. Well, Billy goes home to try to start his car that hasn't worked this entire story. You don't find American machinery doing that. But this time it does work. He heads to Dory's because he knows Kate's working, but apparently she's the only human stupid enough to stick around. And not only that, she's serving them. I guess she really needs that 2.13 an hour. You're working here? So Dory doesn't have to pay an extra waitress. Because I really doubt they're tipping. Or even paying. But they sure are drinking a lot, and not multiplying. So I'm really not sure how that rule works at all. All that from water? They got wet? Yeah, plain water. But Kate discovers that gremlins don't like bright lights when she tries to light one of their cigarettes. Then she uses the flash of a Polaroid camera to make her way to the door. But I'm not sure why she just didn't turn on the ugly lights. What are ugly lights? Well, most bars keep the room dark, and this makes people look better. The ugly lights are just the regular normal lights, but at last call, they turn those on, and you can see how ugly the person you've been hitting on all night is. And if half the room gives up on trying to take someone home because of what they really look like, it's easier to kick the rest of the crowd out. I thought the power of boners was strong. Well, I guess not. What, you having a wood problem? Try Viagra. But when she gets to the door, she's being held at gunpoint. But Billy shows up and blinds the gremlin with his headlights. But when they get back to the car, it won't start again. Goddamn foreign cars. They decide to run to the bank for shelter. And that's when Kate decides to tell Billy why she hates Christmas. Turns out, her dad dressed up as Santa and tried to go down the chimney to surprise her. But he slipped and broke his neck. And they didn't find him until his rotting corpse stunk up the house. Are you saying there's no Santa? No. I'm saying that you should leave going down chimneys to a professional. And that's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. So after that walk down memory lane, they go outside to hear that the street is clear. Billy assumes that these creatures can tell time and have gone to hide from the oncoming daylight. They see a bunch of tracks going into the movie theater and find out that they're all together watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And they love it. Apparently Kate used to work there because she knows where the boiler room is and they head down there to blow up the building. But Stripe ends up leaving the building because the gremlins can somehow figure out how to work a film projector, but not a popcorn maker. They release some gas, light a fire, and go to leave, but the film can runs out and the gremlins can see them behind the screen. They narrowly escape, but it's a good thing that none of them think about going out the front door because it takes as long as it takes the main characters to get to safety for the building to blow up. So now all the gremlins are dead, except Stripe, who's looting some candy in Montgomery Ward. Yum, yum. So they need to kill him before he can multiply again and undo everything they just did. So to get inside, they break the window next to the already broken window, while Stripe makes no attempt to hide at all, which is literally all he has to do to make it through the night. Well, either that or make more gremlins. So since time is of the essence, Billy thinks this is a great time for them to have their first kiss. Are these things real? So Billy's gonna go find Stripe, and Kate's gonna look for a light switch. Billy's so on edge that he mistakes a TV for a gremlin. But then the other TVs come on, and he knows he has to be close. Kate finds a switchboard, but it takes her way too long to realize that it controls the store's speaker system. Listen, gang, Rocket Ricky's getting fed up with all this Orson Welles crap, so cool it, will ya? And for some reason, a fountain. But wouldn't the fountain already have water in it? Well, yeah, but now it's spitting water, so Stripe will know it's full. But he's currently in the hardware department, where they apparently just keep stacks of unpackaged circular saw blades just laying around, and Stripe is throwing them at Billy. Kate notices that Gizmo's gotten away, as she fails to know what a fuse box looks like. Okay, well, let's say for argument's sake that I'm not smart. Gizmo discovers that it's now daytime, and he wants to help Billy, who's being pinned down by a 35-pound creature throwing things at him. Under normal circumstances, you are in trouble. But Stripe now has a crossbow. Now what are you gonna do? And Billy doesn't do anything but lay there and get shot. But he does decide to block the next shot and then gives up on having a shield and throws it at the gremlin who then comes at him with a chainsaw. But Kate stops being an idiot and finds the fuse box and starts turning on the lights. This blinds Stripe and his chainsaw drags him to safety. It also leads him to a clear view of the fountain, and he goes to get some reinforcements. But Gizmo's unboxed a Barbie's dream car, and Rand is stopped in front of the department store with the windows down so Barney can jump out and run in. So now Billy's got some backup too. 
I'm sure it will come in handy. But what I really want to know is, what kind of department store has automatic pitchers and chainsaws plugged in for people to try and guns loaded in the display case? Now why do you gotta drag people in off the street? So Billy's now being held at gunpoint by Stripe, who's standing on the fountain, but evidently not getting wet with his hand in the top layer. But then he sticks his finger in the water and gets pregnant. But before his back boils can pop, Gizmo ramps in and conveniently lands next to the drawstrings for the blinds on the skylight. I'm serious. He pulls them, and then we see what really happens when they get exposed to bright light. They melt. Oh. So the gremlins are dead, Gizmo's fine, and Billy's dad walks in just in time to see why selling mogwais to children is a terrible idea. But of course... This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. So the next night, the news is reporting mass hysteria as the reason for everything that happened, and also brings up the question on how Mrs. Deagle had any money since her husband defrauded the stock market. The bizarre demise of Mrs. Ruby Deagle, widow of convicted stock swindler Donald Deagle. Yeah, it's all rigged. But then the shop owner breaks into their house to collect Gizmo, and is more pissed off that they're letting him watch TV than the fact that they broke the three rules. This guy's a butthole taking his pet away from him. He knows how important the rules are now. Yeah, after millions of dollars in property damage and countless deaths. But he does say he might be able to get him back one day when he's more mature, which I'm not sure when that's gonna be because he's literally financially supporting his parents. Deadbeat. Well, friends, there's one thing you don't have. And what's that? A subscription to this channel. Don't be afraid, there's no reason to be afraid. It's exactly what I've been looking for and I've been everywhere. Bye-bye. Well, Merry Christmas to you, too.